Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking about my project which is the InstaQRP radio transceiver kit. Uh, it is a transceiver kit that, uh, that, we are, that me and my friends are working on. Uh, but before that, this is a little bit about myself. I'm a student at Singapore Polytechnic and I am a licensed radio operator and I'm a co-founder of High Technologies, which is a startup and we wish to uh, design and build equipment such as radio transceivers, antennas, amplifiers and so on. The overview of the, book, of the presentation today is what is amateur radio, a bit on the propagation of HF radio signals, the background of the project, some goals and features that we wish to implement uh, for our uh, design, you know, and some tidbits on the implementation of design, a video demo and the upcoming plans to get this, uh, to get this project uh, up, up and running basically. So first, what is amateur radio? Amateur radio is a hobby where people use radio signals for wireless experimentation, self-training and recreation. So some people may, dis may want to learn about how uh, radio signals are transmitted and received. So they may build their own uh, radio transceivers and, and all that. Or they may uh, decide that they want to implement a new uh, and try out a form of digital modulation. And ra ra amateur radio allows for, for that kind of experimentation, basically. But what makes radio still relevant, even with the internet and smartphones and all that kind of thing today? Well, we use radio all the time from uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 3G and so on. Amateur radio allows you to explore the principles and concepts behind, uh, behind telecommun radio telecommunication systems by allowing for, for the person involved to learn about the concepts and modulation and actually transmit their own signals and receive signals from other radio amateurs. And, and these principles of, uh, of behind radio apply to more complex uh, systems as well, such as your Wi-Fi, 3G and so on. Also, in 2013, Typhoon Yolanda made landfall in the Philippines. There are also a lot of telecommunications infrastructure, such as mo uh, cellular and mobile uh, towers were damaged or destroyed during the, uh, during the event. And Amateur radio operators were deployed to help in the relief efforts, such as uh, locating of uh, missing persons, uh, passing on aid and supplies to people who are in the affected areas, and so on. And a radio transceiver on its own doesn't need and too much infrastructure. You, you just need a transceiver itself, the ba uh, battery pack, and antenna. And once you have all these, you can speak to anyone around in the region. You do not need to rely on the cellular towers or what to send messages. And this, and this is what makes uh, the experimentation of uh, shortwave radio still uh, relevant in in a world in such a connected world today. I'd like to now speak about the propagation of HF radio signals or high frequency radio signals. Most communications on the amateur radio uh, frequency band uh, frequency bands take place in the in the band called the HF frequency band. The range of frequencies in this band are from three megahertz to thirty megahertz. But what makes this band of frequencies so special is that the radio signals in the HF band can be reflected by a layer of gases surrounding the Earth called the ionosphere. The, so your HF signals will be reflected by the Earth's ionosphere, whereas your high frequency VHF and UHF signals, which are more commonly used for, for things such as uh, Wi-Fi and so on, they, are re, they, are, they just pass through the ionosphere. They are not reflected by the ionosphere, and as such, they cannot go long distances. Whereas on HF, because your ionosphere is reflecting all these uh, signals, it makes, it makes it useful for international communications. That's why it, even in maritime or aviation uh, uh, communications, people still use HF signals uh, when VHF and UHF communications is not possible. A little bit of background on our project. Amateur radio equipment can be very expensive, especially for HF transceivers and so on. So we thought, 
why not we build something like a HF trans transceiver? This this is not our uh, our our project, but I wanted to do something similar to these kits that you can find on eBay, which allow you to transmit and receive uh, simple Morse code signals. So we wanted to come up that uh, something that is uh, easy to assemble and low cost enough for people to want to get into amateur radio and try it and try it out. So for us, our goals are to use as common and easy parts as possible, as, as much as possible, because if you damage uh, or you find that a part is faulty, it is easier to replace it when your, when your parts such as your transistor are easily available in your local radio store or, or electronic store rather. And since we are trying to make this as a kit that we can for people to learn and understand about radio transmission, we want to make the circuit design as simple as possible. Of course, there will be certain elements or aspects of, uh, of uh, radio electronics that can be a bit more complicated to understand at, uh, at first glance. Uh, so, so we want to simplify uh, the, the circuit as much as we can. So, and that will also make it easy to modify, upgrade this uh, this transceiver in future. So some of the features we are trying to Im implement right now in our current design are super heterodyne receiver. We want to also give it things like the, a digital frequency synthesis for your RF and intermediate frequency signals. And for now we only support two modulation schemes which is Morse code and single sideband modulation which is a variant of amplitude modulation which I'll cover in a bit. And some planned features for the uh, near future is uh, transceiver control via USB, so you can use a PC to control the uh, the transceiver, which will allow for things like PSK31 and other forms of digital modulation to be to to, uh, to be used on the transceiver itself. And we also want to do things like the spectrum display of the, on the computer, so that we can so you can uh, show your spectrum, the receive spectrum. Of your radio signals and run show it on the on the PC, so it's easier for you to detect where your uh, where your signals are being sent on. So you can so you can adjust the transceiver frequency to listen on that on that frequency. And this is just a block diagram of the of the entire transceiver. I'm not going to go through all of uh, all of the the parts and and so on. But I just want to go through some of the more, uh, uh, just some of the uh, the sections of the design itself. We will just start with the dig digital side of uh, of things. The microcontroller we use is the STM32 F0, and it's actually quite easy to obtain and it's inexpensive, and it's a 32-bit R microcontroller. So this is the design that. Uh, that we are using. We originally wanted to use Arduino for our for for our uh, project. Not really the Arduino, but the chip used in Arduino. However, we found that we we quickly ran out of uh, we ran out of uh, input output pins to use. So we have to use a uh, a uh, microcontroller with more pins. And what I found that the that the next lowest cost uh, thing that we can find is actually the SDM32 and such we are using this SDM32 microcontroller in our design. Of course, if you are uh, building a radio, you need some form, some way or some form of frequency generation. We are doing we are using a SR5351 uh, clock generator clock generator chip, which can give you three outputs, and it can and all these three outputs can generate frequencies up to two hundred megahertz. And since this is this chip can be interfaced by the I squared C bus, it allows for uh, easy implementation of this uh, chip in our design, and it's used to generate the intermediate frequencies and the RF local oscillator frequencies that we use that we use in the transmit and receive stage of your transceiver. And as you can see, all you all you really need are your I I squared C pull up resistors, your uh, crystal and and that's it, you have a uh, simple and, uh, circuit for a frequency generator for, for whatever purposes you may need it for. We did notice though, uh, we, we were getting a frequency error. We were supposed to generate a 30 MHz uh, signal, but we were getting about 
29.912 megahertz. So we wanted to investigate and see what's the issue. The application, the standard application diagram shows that we actually do not need uh, any external uh, load capacitors as there are already load capacitors inside the chip itself as you can see at the oscillator stage CL1 and C, uh, CL2. What, so by right, we do not need any more capacitors outside uh, on, on the external side of the chip to uh, generate any uh, frequency and such. But we found that that may be contributing to the frequency error and we added, decided that we wanted to add a few external capacitors. And, and since this is a 25 MHz crystal, the SI5351 uh, can only support 25 or 27 MHz crystals. So we decided to use okay, 25 MHz crystals. Uh, and what we did was that we programmed the SI5351 to generate a frequency output of 25 MHz, which is supposed to be the frequency output of the crystal itself, so it should be just one to one. And we found that, hey, the error at 25 MHz is actually uh, quite low. There's only a 23 Hz error. But we are still investigating why there is a 19.8 kilohertz error at 30 megahertz. It seems that at certain frequency bands, the error is quite varied. It, I do not think that uh, the that this is a problem with the analog side of uh, of the of the design. It may be more of the it may be more of the code things like setting of the registers and all that may be a bit off. And as such, this could be contributing to the. Uh, frequency error as you can see. This is, uh, we are trying to generate a 30 uh, max signal as you see, and, and yes, we have a 19.8 kilohertz error. So that's something that we need to investigate. Let us also look at uh, modulation of signals. Uh, modulation is a process of modifying carrier weight it, in one way or another, for it to carry information, either in its amplitude, frequency, or phase even. The simplest form of modulation is on-off keying, basically just turning the carrier on or off. By, by turning the carrier wave on or off, you can send information, and the most notable example that a lot of people may have already heard of is actually Morse code. You're just turning the carrier on and off, and the receiver just puts in the tone for you at the receiver receive side of things. So you can listen to the Morse code and actually uh, find out what the person is sent at the other end is sending. But to co carry more complex uh, signals such as sound or voice, you, you need other forms of modulation. One example is amplitude modulation, where the modulating signal such as your voice or music signal changes the amplitude of the carrier, carrier wave itself. As you can see in the image, the amplitude of the carrier uh, varies with the modulating signal. So as you can see on the top, you can see the envelope of the modulating signal on the carrier itself. And in the receiver, they just need to pass it through a filter and it can demodulate the signal. However, amplitude modulation is an inefficient form of modulation as most of the RF energy, or the radio frequency energy, goes to the carrier itself. About 68% of whatever transmit power you may be giving goes to the carrier and, that's, and, th and that makes amplitude modulation very inefficient. So, and even without a modulating signal, the carrier will still be present. So during uh, certain points in your signal where there's date time where there's no modulating signal, you're still transmitting a carrier and that, co uh, that is a waste of power actually. So we have a variant of amplitude modulation called single sideband transmission, which, and people found that in amplitude modulation, you send the carrier and you're actually sending two sidebands, one side, a sideband that is slightly higher in frequency from your carrier and one sideband that is slightly lower in frequency than the carrier. And actually both of these sidebands carry the same uh, audio or voice information that you want to receive. So in such a case, why not just remove one of the sidebands and, su and suppress the carrier? That, so all of your transmit power and your power amplifier will just go into the sideband itself. One thing to know about single sideband transmission is that 
because you're suppressing the carrier already, there's no, no signal is transmitted when, the when there's no modulating signal at all. So it's more power efficient and it actually uses uh, less bandwidth than amplitude modulation because you're removing one of these side bands. So if you look at the frequent at the spectrum uh, display, you only see one of the side bands, and as such, the bandwidth of the transmission is actually uh, smaller now. But so how do we generate single side band signals? We use something called balance mixer to generate a double side band suppressed carrier. We, so the, the balance mixer will first suppress the carrier, remove the carrier first, leaving behind only the two side bands. And you filter out one of the side bands, either the lower side band or the side band. And in our design, this is the this is the block diagram basically. Uh, it's just your microphone, and and you have a mixer that gives you your that gives you an intermediate frequency, and that is your uh, and that is your single side band output uh, that that you're getting. Our implementation is using SA612 balance mixer IC and a ceramic filter, a 455 kHz ceramic filter that acts like a sideband filter. I'll get to how the uh, sidebands are filtered out in a moment. But as you can see, this is a circuit simulation showing the double sideband suppressed carrier signal. Uh, and this and such, this is the output. And you can look at the uh, frequency uh, spectrum of the output and, and you see that this, the carrier is suppressed leaving behind only two sidebands which you can see are the two peaks in your signal wow okay that that is not showing very well it, you should see two two uh, peaks uh, you should see uh, two peaks here actually but I'm not sure why it's not displaying correctly there are two peaks here and your carrier here is actually suppressed, but it's not showing properly on this display right now. So now we have a double sideband suppressed carrier signal coming out from our balance modulator circuit. So how do we filter out the sideband? Before that, we look at something called RF mixer. We use RF mixers in your in your uh, frequency conversion stages, such as your intermediate frequency stages before uh, and your RF uh, transmission stages. And what it does is it performs something called frequency mixing. You have two input frequencies and it actually generates an output that contains the sum and the difference of the, of the two inputs. So if you have a frequency of F1 and you have another input frequency F2, you get F1 plus F2 and F1 minus F2. And, and that's the output of your... And that's a generalized uh, output. Expect the output of your mixer. The IF frequency, uh, filter frequency response uh, is this. And just now I did mention that we are using a ceramic filter at 455 kHz. And this is the measured frequency response that we, that we got when we measured it in the lab. And how does it, and why is it important? Because uh, right now I could adjust the local oscillator frequency at the mixer itself. So that I can push out one of the side bands out of the pass band of this uh, ceramic filter, and in, and for example, if I want to transmit upper side upper side band, I could adjust the local oscillator such such that the uh, lower side band is actually pushed out of the pass band of the ceramic filter, and if I want to do the if I want to transmit lower side band. I could just filter. I could just adjust my local oscillator frequency a bit, and I push out my upper side band out of the pass band of the uh, of, of the filter, and that's how you uh, get your, your individual side bands. In amateur radio, uh, there is no reason why you couldn't use the lower side band, upper side band. There is no technical reason that I am aware of, and what I'm what I'm told though is that it's a is a common practice that frequencies, if you are transmitting on frequencies below 14 MHz, you use the lower sideband, and on frequencies above 14 MHz, you use upper sideband. But, but if there is any technical reason for that, I am not aware as of this point. And right now, I just want to show a, a video demonstration of, uh, of, the trans 
of our unit transmitting, uh, we have not got our single sideband modulation properly working yet. So I'll just, I'll just be showing a Morse code transmission or CW transmission. And this is the demo. Just give me a moment. Wait, why is Uh, just give just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I couldn't find my mouse just now. Okay. Okay. So this is the uh, this is at the pre amplifier before the transmit amplifier of our. Of our circuit, and you can, and you can see as we transmit, uh, the the carrier has a lot of harmonics, and you need to filter all these harmonics. That this will be done in the power amplifier stage, but you can see that our frequency counter will display the frequency of transmission, and you can see the display on the scope. And this is our radio receiver that which we are using to verify that we are transmitting our signal correctly. And, and I'm just transmitting a Morse code uh, signal, which is just general call, general call, general call from my call sign, which is 9 v one again. So I'm just calling anyone in, who may be listening to this transmission. But because we are now uh, connected to the dummy load, there is, uh, there, no one is going to listen to it actually. Okay, and just a moment. And I'd like to just discuss, uh, before we end off, ju just some uh, upcoming plans. For now, in the next few weeks, we're just looking at, uh, at finishing our functional prototype and we'll, we'll be looking to manufacture and crowdfund the uh, project. So we need to settle things like the mechanic, the case itself, the enclosure itself, the manufacture of the boards, the packing of all the parts and, and all that to a unit that can be delivered and shipped to the user. And before that, we would like to just produce a small number of testing units for a few radio operators to get their feedback and their opinions uh, from, from them. And since uh, this, all these are open source, uh, our, we will be putting out all our code and all our circuits for this uh, transceiver uh, on our GitHub page here at High Technology slash InstaQRP. And we'll, we'll be uh, putting up updates from time to time and especially when we are nearing uh, production of our uh, transceiver kit itself. And I'm actually down here. Are there any questions? The, the drift on your, on your 30 MHz, could it be just that your, the, the, the instrument you're actually using is not, not precise enough? Yes, it could be. Uh, what? However, however, in our instrument, we do it, it does come with a internal frequency standard, which is separate from the from the rest of the surface itself, which can be used to verify the the uh, counter accuracy. And as you can see, when in the video, the our, our radio receiver it, it is receiving at the exact frequency in which our frequency counter is showing uh, the the transmit frequency to be at. So I'm so I'm quite certain that the that the output of the oh sorry that the frequency counter is actually measuring the uh, correct uh, frequency that uh, the the counter is not the problem. I I did notice that a different frequency bands as for amateur radio operators we do have a few bands in the HF uh, frequency bands. There are a few bands like for example the seven meg band, the fourteen megahertz band, twenty eight and so on. We found that a different Bands, there is a there is a slight error, and the error is not predictable. Sometimes can be off by a few by a few tens of kilohertz. Sometimes only off by a few a few hertz. Why suspect? It, as I said earlier, it could be code because you need to set the the registers 
of the SFR351 and, and the setting of the registers could, uh, could, may not be proper, our code may not be working properly to, uh, to ensure that our frequency output is correct, that is exact frequency that we want to operate. At. When, when, when you generate the 30, uh, 30, 30 megahertz or kilohertz? Uh, 30 megahertz. You, you cannot expect to have 30, oh, yeah. 0, 0, 0, 1. I mean, the error there is, uh, is, it will always be there because it will be drifting with the temperature and with everything. Uh, yes, that you cannot, I don't know, you should have an expectation of how much drift you have in, in mm -hmm. there. And then the measurement is not always. Uh, so if you really want to see the exact one, I would suggest that you find some other places where, which has a, a more modern one, and the digital one, or maybe a more precise. Sometimes what you measure, what you see, is not always what, you, what it is because of the error itself in the measurement. Uh, y yes, it uh, yes it could be possible, but as I said earlier, the I'm using my radio as a reference. So, so if my radio is able to receive my transmitted signal as per the demo just now, it means that the frequency counter is actually uh, is actually working properly. I do not need uh, I do not need uh, down to uh, exact hertz level accuracy. But for CW signals or Morse code signals, we are we are looking at uh, bandwidths that may in in the range of say a few tens of hertz and to about hundred hertz at most, depending on how fast you are transmitting your your Moscow signal, how fast you are keying. The we need a bit more accuracy for for these kind of signals. As if you're off by a few tens of hertz, you may miss the signal. You may not hurt the signal because your frequency your frequency is slightly off from the trans from the transmitter, and that's what we uh, not want to do. Uh, we, that's that's a problem that we do not wish to uh, to face, and we're trying to fix this uh, issue right now. Stand speaker.